Hi, I'm Lynn Bridgeford from Aether Bios, and today in our series on mental health and coaching, we're going to be talking to a very wonderful woman that I know called Phyllis Woodfine, who is a black woman. And in honor of Black History Month and Black History Year, Phyllis, I would like to ask you to give us something of your journey, your experience as a woman, as a black woman in all the wonderful, inspiring things that I've seen you do in your life and probably many that I haven't. <laughs> oh, thank, thanks, Lynn. Um, lovely introduction. Yeah, so um, Black History Month uh, is always one of those things I think about thinking that, you know, what we need is we need Black history to be part of general history. Um, and so that's always something that I, I hope will one day be the case but as a black woman growing up in the 60s um, and the early 70s in the UK there were many experiences that I went through that probably um, shaped who I am today um, in many ways and uh, I um, grew up in an area of South London um, called Peckham which is very different to what it was like when I grew up and it's been through many different changes um, due to various incidents that had happened but at the time that I grew up um, it was probably quite the bit that I was in was quite a um, probably more a white area there weren't very many people of colour there and there certainly weren't very many black people mm -hmm. um, who lived where I lived and the school that I went to there were um, a mixture of kids, um, but it was probably more predominantly white. Um, so I was always aware that I was a black child, but I never, I was never particularly um, held back by the racism that I experienced, and I did. Um, but I was always of the, well, I'm going to get on and do what I need to do, despite it. And in spite of all the things that, that, that went on, I think. Um, and so I had a very happy childhood. I went to uh, grammar school because I passed my 11 plus. So again, <laughs> when I went to that school, I think I, in my class of 30, there were three um, black children um, in the class, two, two, uh, two other girls um, at the time. And the whole school, again, that wasn't very mixed. Um, so I was quite used to being in that environment um, and just got on with it. And my determination at that time probably was, I had a number of things that I thought I wanted to do. One of which was um, be a teacher of some kind, but not of children. Um, <laughs> certainly work in fashion. I don't know where that came from. I used to make my own clothes and so maybe that came from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, or work in housing and possibly to do something with health, but I never had any definite idea. The upshot of it was I went on to train as a building surveyor, something completely different to what <laughs> I do now. Very. Uh, um, and again, it was moving into an area where I worked in local government and there were very few um, black people and certainly black women. There were a few black men, but there weren't many black women who were training to do what I did because I went to college and worked so I was at college two days a week and worked three days a week in order to do my training so I was used I it was also there weren't many women who were doing it at that time so we're talking about the early 80s mm. um and I was quite used to that um and carried on despite yes I did I sexism I encountered definitely mm -hmm. and some racism um, but I was never one to shy away from it. I would confront it. If somebody said something, then I would, um, you know, try and, why are you saying that? You know, what do you think about it? Um, anyway, so I carried on in that world and then decided that actually I'd always been interested in health. Mm -hmm. um, when I was 19, I started a psychology degree, but because I was doing this other course I couldn't really do that and do everything that I was doing so I stopped it after about a year so it was, I was doing that part-time but that was in the back of my head that I wanted to do that and I also wanted to do something with health I'd been an athlete um, and so I knew I wanted to do something that helped them so it took me until I was 30 
just before I was 30 to make the decision to do a part-time course. I did complementary therapies. I then went on to retrain as an osteopath eventually in my mid thirties. And I love it as much now as I did then. But again, it was a profession that I moved into in the early nineties um, where there were not that many black people who were doing it. There were a few men. Um, there were some people of color, so uh, some Asian people who were doing it, but there weren't that many black women who were osteopaths. And certainly within the training, I experienced some racism mm -hmm. and a lot of sexism, I've got to be honest, mm -hmm. but I never ever let that help me help hold me back. Um, Unfortunately, I'm of that sort of a character that I will get on and do things. I will think, right, this is what I want to do. <laughs> and uh, you're not going to hold me back. Um, and I'm going to make sure that I'm doing it to the best of my ability and show you that it doesn't matter that I'm black. It doesn't matter that I'm a woman. I can do this job. And in fact, actually, I can probably do it better than you. Uh, <laughs> so that was my <laughs> determination. Um, but also to call out those people who were making those comments um and so I've always done that but I've always done it in a way that I suppose that highlights it to other people I've tried not to be aggressive with what I'm doing but I'm very forthright about it um probably a little bit opinionated generally in life <laughs> we all have opinions <laughs> but I think I'm probably more assertive than anything else so my osteopathic journey, um, once I qualified, I, did, I got asked to go back to the college where I was training to help teach. So I was assisting. And then after a couple of years, I started doing some teaching and I did my teaching qualifications and I did, you know, loads of CCPD as we all do. Um, and certainly the one thing that I tried to make sure of whilst teaching was I remembered when we were being taught that often when you were being told about what you needed to look at when you were doing sort of like the clinical testing when you were taking on board what was happening with your patients it would obviously it would often be from a very caucasian or white perspective mm. so for example if they were talking about looking at skin color it wouldn't talk about black skin and how it might look slightly different to white skin so certainly in my teaching that ended up being one of the things that i would try and bring in as well to 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 make it all round to make it accessible to others um and it's getting better but slowly mm -hmm. um and i think that's with all things certainly we know you know when the whole george floyd incident happened two years ago what happened there and the the groundswell around the world um, and certainly in England the, and the UK, the Black Lives Matter movement, how that um, affected things. And I think what it what it has done is highlighted some of those things that haven't changed. So we might not have the Ku Klux Klan or the National Front front and centre, um, you know, doing things. But that's not to say that it isn't happening in the background, that there isn't systemic racism, um, that there are not microaggressions, whatever you want to call them, that go on. And, um, you know, thinking about something as simple as the other day, and I'm literally talking about a couple of weeks ago when I went to the shops, um, when the security guard started watching me as I was going around. Now, I'm a middle aged black woman with my mask on, not doing a great deal. It's like, seriously, what am I going to do? <laughs> And there were other people who, you know, I thought maybe a little bit more suspicious than me, who that security guard was not following around, but they were following me. So it's just little things like that, little comments that get made that you are aware of and that you just think, well, you know, it's there. It's still there. And how is that going to, to change? And I think the only way we can change it is by calling it out. Mm -hmm. And certainly by um, by being being aware that it happens, but doing it in a way, as I said, call it out in a way that's trying to explain to them 
what it is that you're feeling and why you're feeling that and also how maybe would be a better way to do it. Phyllis, it really strikes me how, I mean, I know you're, you're amazing. I've, I've always been in awe of the number of things you do and how well you do them and with so much heart. Where did you get that strength from to be able to stand up and speak for yourself and say things in a non-aggressive way and call people out? Was it something just inside you or something from your upbringing, from your family? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably a combination of all of those things. Certainly my upbringing is a real um, you know, I, I come from, you know, I was born in the UK. I was born in Britain. My parents came over in the fifties, um, as, uh, immigrants from the West Indies, from Jamaica, they were invited over. Certainly my dad came over first because they were looking for people to come over and help, um, the country get back on its feet after the war years. Um, my dad was came before my mother um, and they in fact got married in this country. Um, they were after the wind, wind rush. So we were just a, a few years after the wind, wind rush generation, but literally a couple of years after that. Um, and they were subjected to outright racism. Um, and I think the way that they conducted themselves and grew a family, made a, a, you know a, an area for themselves, mixed in, you know, as I said, they didn't go to an area that was, you know, almost like it becomes that you'll get all black people moving that area or whatever. My parents didn't do that. They did help one another because they were one of those who bought a property and rented rooms out to other people so that, they had somewhere to live because it was that time of no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, you know, the awful situation. Um, but despite all of that, they still stayed in the country and they instilled in us that Britain was, you know, we were English. It was part, our heritage was of the West Indies, but we were English and we had a right to be where we were and we could talk about that. And they were never aggressive in their attitude to those people who had been racist to them. They were forthright and they were opinionated about it and they were vocal, but they weren't aggressive. And I think because of that, that instilled the same in us. And it also instilled the fact that as far as they were concerned, and this will happen in any, in, you know, um, probably in any immigrant population, particularly where you, you know, those parents will always want their children to do better than they did. And that was where our parents was, you know, my mum, my dad was a labourer and my mum worked as an auxiliary nurse and a cleaner just to put her kids through, you know, their kids through school to get them to have the best that they could be. And although we weren't, it wasn't shoved down our throats about education. It was, you know, known that my mum wanted to stay on at school but couldn't afford to. So left school at 16, at uh, uh, 14, in fact. Um, and so it was instilled in us, look, you've got the chance to have an education, do the best you can. Whatever you do, as long as you are doing the best you can, that's what we will be happy with. And that was the same about any attitudes that we're, you know, that if you get into a fight over something, is there a reason why you got in there? Was there a better way you could deal with it? And if you can talk your way out of it, if you can talk about how things can be done better, then that's probably a better way of getting there. And that's that's how they brought us up. And I think that's a lot of, you know, how I've become who I, ha I am, you know, and have wanted to achieve things, but not to the detriment of others and not, you know, it's that, trying to bring others with you and trying to educate people fabulous role sounds like you've had fabulous role models they uh, my parents were wonderful they were mm. really great yeah Amazing. and you yourself has, have gone on to do other things to particularly to empower women yes <laughs> <laughs> and worked in many more fields and still still always studying yeah yeah i mean one of the things i suppose 
that I've always thought, and it, and it is that that education is key and learning is key. And whilst you keep your brain moving and occupied and learning new things, that's got to be one of the best things for you. And you know, knowledge is amazing. And I don't, you know, the day that I think I don't want to learn something new will probably be, you know, when I'm ready for my box. <laughs> amazing amazing and you do it all with from the heart which is what gives it so much power and it sounds like your parents brought you up with so much heart as well even in adversity and some of the situations sound like they must have been really challenging to just hold your ground be in your center be in your heart and confront people in a loving way and still keep your own integrity yeah they yeah yeah def definitely and um you know i think it's that that part of you that remember there but for the grace of you know of god if you believe in in that but you know anything could it's only luck rather than judgment that i am where i am you know that i landed here that i was born at this time that i wasn't born in another time so you've got to try and make the best of what you can but also try and make some improvements in things so if you can rather than I've always been that person who I'll put my head above the parapet I won't sit back and just say well that was really awful oh, I wish I hadn't happened you know I, I don't think that you can moan about something if you're not prepared to do something to change it and yes you know there'll come a point when we'll do less of it you know I remember in the 80s walking you know doing the anti-apartheid marches um doing my fundraising doing all of those things as I've got older I've done less of that radical stuff I suppose um because, you've got older or because it's not as necessary yeah yeah I think it's I think a combination of both so when I was as I was talking about the Black Lives Matter movement I've got to admit the idea of going on a march at that time didn't fill me with horror but at the same time I was thinking I don't know that I could do that now I'll do lots of stuff I will raise awareness I will talk mm -hmm. and I will be honest I did feel a little bit guilty that I hadn't gone on um a couple of the marches one of them I couldn't go on anyway because I was already committed to doing something else mm -hmm. um but yeah there was a part of me that was thinking oh you know you're not that old you probably could have done <laughs> <laughs> well, but I would you do, you do so many things yeah. you do so many things that help so many people so it's been wonderful spending time with you phyllis thank you so much for joining us and giving some insight into your life and your upbringing and the amazing beautiful black woman and i have checked with phyllis that she prefers to be called black and a woman <laughs> so the the most amazing black woman that you are it's an honor to know you thank you lynn Thank you so much.